and I'm gonna just record it just in case uh, myself so yeah okay so team meeting agenda March 19th um, Okay, uh, welcome everybody to Tuesday, March 19, meeting of the OSC development team. So today, what I have on my plate here is more updates on so a few exciting things happening right now. So for example, the manufacturing execution systems work uh, towards the, what we may call the open source everything store, uh, OSCS open source everything store. I want to see if we can maybe start talking about that a little bit. But uh, also a good update uh, on the incentive challenge work uh, regarding real solid conceptualization on that and then updates on D3D. Um, let's see. So I'll, I'll start it. And, and this week, let's have the next session of the open source golf cart design sprint. We've got a lot of uh, the design in for that. And one, one last thing is uh, hey, the, the clamp part, that's actually working. I'll get back to that. Uh, but that's on my personal Facebook page if you want to pull it up. Uh, if you want to copy and paste that from my own uh, Facebook where I posted this. So, so first thing is, let's talk about the manufacturing execution systems. So we've heard uh, John bring this topic up and he's working on this so he he's uh, intending to have a, a demo facility of this facility or demo minimum working product of this uh pretty soon in the next i guess in the next week or so uh basically implementing the idea that you can order parts that are 3d printed online automatic processing of payment and therefore um also connected to a physical production plant of a 3D printer that can knock off parts and, and uh, print parts and then knock them off the build plate so that we can set up somewhat of an automated production system for hardware. Now the, the good part about it is of course as always fully open source tool chains so I recommend do take a look at that video uh, that's actually just posted that from Friday. Um, let me see let me go to the YouTube. Oh yeah, you can just click on it instead right. of for me. Uh, but yeah, very very much worth listening to get, to get the concept and what's possible today because right now it's in the world. somewhat somewhat of low hanging fruit to take existing open source software, open source three D printers, and internet infrastructures that make this pretty much feasible right now today with and, and then with a little bit of work with the open source tool chain. So. Not sure what. Um, haven't looked too much into who is doing open source work on this. Haven't studied the industry standards, but I haven't seen this anywhere. To, of course, as far as who has something that's fully open source, where you can replicate a manufacturing system, where you connect 3D printers and ordering online and so for the whole whole kind of a tool chain for that. I'm sure there's pieces of that, and various people have done it. But where can we find something that we can really build upon and? maybe invite those people as collaborators so that that is really good now uh, that ties into the the work of the 3d printers so this is basically the latest build here this is what i'm building right now still haven't run it i <clears throat> was doing a lot of troubleshooting of this uh, kind of like there's a lot of minor changes here so i'll go through that but <clears throat> the current version v3 v1902 as you see here now is able to access the full 8 by 8 inch reach of the bed uh, and I think it's about going to be about seven inches in the Z direction, but it's it's such that the axis rides on top, and you're able to reach all the all the space. Now this is with a 12-inch frame. Okay, so this is a tiny frame. Now 12 inches takes care of some of the shipping issues, like for example, I mentioned the USPS uh, flat rate shipping box that will take care of it. The large one it's 12 by 12 inches and this printer is actually just slightly under 12 like 11 7 eighths um, for the outer one for the, the outer frame reaches so say we're shipping this okay so working on some production engineering issues with that 
Um, one thing I found out was that uh, I mentioned the through hole in one of the carriages for wiring, uh, for sending the wiring all the way through. Uh, that happened not to work. I had to reroute the wiring because simply they were the wires that were gonna were interfering with the frame at the end of the motion, so no good. End stops. The end stops are great. It's the smaller version of end stops um, that you can see. Uh, the source for this is D3DV 1902. Let me actually share share my screen. Uh, share D3D V 1902 page. So you see this. This is the actual extruder that's used with the sensor holder fan blower. Um, new end stops look like what you have here in these. So so a tiny, very tiny structure that holds a tiny end stop and it mounts right on the rods. That's working well. Um, the new sensor fan holder I mentioned. Now the nozzle I also over the CAD, so the CAD is fully drawn up. Now the CAD, let me see, I'm going to um, open up the CAD right here. Um, do we have one here? I'm not sure if I have the CAD on my desktop here. I'm going to just download it. I'll show you one detail about uh, it's 589 um, K right now. I'll show you a couple of features. So one thing I had to do here was raise the in a in a real build. As you may see in this picture here, I'll zoom into that. This thing is riding over the frame completely. So we have a Titan Arrow nozzle, so the big big Titan heater block. but it's riding above the surface of the frame and why because if i i want to make sure that when people are using this and they're starting up um that there's never a case where the nozzle could actually hit the frame which wasn't an, like if you look at the cad right now what's the cad show well the cad shows that the nozzle let me just do a view orthographic so look at this See, the nozzle is like right at the top of the, the frame. In reality, it happened to be like maybe a little lower because this CAD may be slightly inaccurate. But what I had to do is uh, raise. I, I had to redrill the holes in the frame to raise this so the nozzle does not very conclusively ever hit the frame because you can break the nozzle, uh, break the heater block off the entire structure if you ram into it, um, ram into the frame with the stepper motors. So yeah, just raise that up to be completely safe. Um, this is pretty much how, how the thing looks. Uh, for the for the bed, you see these sandwiches of, of idler pieces that are raising it. All I did here was actually I didn't do the, this was my initial idea that it turned out what I did was use a motor piece standing vertically. So instead of using three more pieces, I used one motor piece standing vertically caught through the nut catcher holes in a motor so you know how the x you can have x to y connections using the universal access system like for example where you connect the bed here to the carriage uh through using these nut catcher uh, through holes nut catchers inside uh, some of the printed pieces but that's how i attach the uh, motor piece to make a vertical platform stand why because the bed has to be a little higher because the, the nozzle is so high, the, the printing gantry is so high. So why all this mess about using these standard parts? Well, one of the design principles here is absolute minimum part count. So that's by design, so that we're not adding any more additional parts here. It also uh, had a slight discovery too, that uh, which was kind of accidental, but we know that this system is designed for using just two bolts to put the entire uh, universal axis together. 18 millimeters and 30 millimeter M6 bolts. Two bolts. Once again, minimum part count. Turns out the M18 bolt, and this is a very fine detail, the M18 bolt is actually sufficient if you use, in this piece right here, if instead of uh, using, this is 
a clamshell of two pieces, which is not drawn in detail here, but it's a clamshell of two pieces. If you use the M18 bolt, you can also do that. So standard, you use the M30 bolt to go through this uh, piece if you want to use the nut hatch catcher hole of the piece that's lying perpendicular to it. Turns out that with the M18 bolt, you can use one half piece um, and use the bottom piece and, and go straight to a piece with a nut catcher like the, the motor piece. So uh, coincidentally or incidentally or accidentally, the M18 is actually able to catch a half uh, sandwich to another nut catcher in another perpendicular part. Uh, that may be just all gibberish to you, but if you work with the system, you'll see that that's actually a cool artifact because it allows you to do a different way to connect two things at right angles using no, no additional parts. Okay, that's... Um, that's a discovery which was kind of interesting uh, from my perspective since we're like we're saying we've got just a few tiny tiny set of pieces what is it like uh what was that number like 12 or something some small number that gets you the entire universal access system it's only like somewhere in a tens area which i don't think anybody else does so for the entire universal access um good stuff on that so moving forward and yeah this thing is looking pretty sweet i am expecting now i didn't print print anything yet but i'm expecting absolute top quality prints um what you see here so let me just give you this detail here but this is this um this piece here that i'm pointing to so let me zoom into that because that's the point of the automatic alignment of the two y axes so part of the trick here to make this run smoothly with loose axes is to make sure that you never have the x-axis bind up between the two y-axes. Um, I'm going to zoom in. It's not allowing me to zoom in for some reason. Let's zoom in this way. This piece here is the half carriage piece it's got the bearing inside so if the this is one of the y axes here if the y, y1 and y2 are not exactly parallel this has a little play where this can go in and out of the this this idler piece which has bearings inside of it so so the actual motion is carried the idler piece this is the functional idler piece and then this one is the alignment piece where these rods can go in and out if the y axes are not parallel and that looks like that's great. That means we'll never, ever get binding up. And you don't have to even pay attention to how parallel your y-axes are. Whereas before, we had to be very careful that they're quite parallel. Otherwise, your axes would bind up. So it's a good, good step forward in terms of ease of producing this thing on your own. Uh, once again, going for industrial productivity on a small scale, meaning distributed production, distributed enterprise, where anybody can do this without particularly requiring very high skill sets to make this work well and work at i mean how well professional grade the perfect prints uh, made by creatures yeah um so let me continue on to the incentive challenge um so incentive challenge uh, I can send you guys, and you can actually remind me afterwards. I can't share this in the public because my coach, I have a coach for marketing, and he's not. Uh, we think we're going to do some major, major annihilation of <laughs> transformation of uh, various sectors. So he didn't want to publish this for threat of, of success. But <laughs> uh, the idea is I can send you the, the conversation. It was an hour-long conversation, but we, we really made some progress on the design challenge Part, the, the step where we're talking about the cordless drill being a, an online challenge and putting a lot of effort to it so actually raising the bar quite a bit getting so if we do it on the cordless drill we would involve Home Depot Lowe's and Menards we would involve those people for distribution but basically the idea being uh, put a lot of energy into it uh, enlist the developers not only for the design challenge but with a very explicit intent of 
of them having this as a sideline business opportunity. So, so creating enough of that infrastructure to make it happen. So that means some of the business development sides would have to go into the development challenge. So um, what's new about this? Nothing much outside of what was the news to me was that a person, namely my coach, uh, totally got onto the idea of this, this concept of a distributive enterprise where we're going mainstream and actually scaling completely through mom and pop operations, distributed production, all the stuff we've been talking about. Uh, so meaning fully open source, fully open source tool chain for production. Uh, fully open source design and with the intent that we're actually would would be able to succeed in a given marketplace like a cordless drill which is a 10 billion dollar global market now um, the idea here is and and I, I wrote about this a little bit since this is a hot topic for me if you look at uh, the link on this page uh, so fit this thing uh, look at the open source product development incentive challenges. Um, let's go to that. I wrote about this, the concepts we can please study this. This is getting good. Uh, so under open source product development, we have different ways how we go about it. So talking about how we involve schools, how we can involve people in a general process in OSC, and then the incentive challenges part so if you go to the incentive challenges, there's a bunch of notes on the mechanics of that. Um, so I guess the main highlights that I'd like to summarize are that we involve the developers in a deep way. They're true stakeholders. Uh, there's nothing new here really like compared to what we've been talking about in terms of concepts, but the, the, the bottom line ends up with execution, right? So, so it's about, can we build the relationships? Can we do the marketing properly to make this happen? And can we get the resources to make this happen? Because right now we're talking about, uh, I mentioned to my coach, okay, 100K, then you get as the incentive prize. That's, that sounds like a lot of money. Uh, we think it'll actually take more than that because we need some more infrastructure to, to make that happen, to make sure that the marketing happens, the community building happens. Um, and then the question is, how do you fundraise that? Well, once again, crowdsourcing. Uh, so we have to have a compelling case and, and some credibility behind this. Um, but that's that's the state. The, the idea was that my coach was able to understand that and completely see the potential and that to the point that he was suggesting that, yeah, we can make a significant and scalable dent on this at least to the point that there was no struggle whether this is possible it's definitely possible and the question now now comes down to okay how do you actually end up doing this uh whereas before i was running it like you know when i talk about this to different people it's like uh yeah a uh, nice idea <laughs> but how are you gonna do that this this is more like okay this is good we can make it work how do we make it work right so that was very encouraging and this is the, the beginning of that uh, and that completely goes into the work with a 3d printer because if you talk about a small enterprise for that you can also incorporate life cycle stewardship that means you're uh, getting your raw materials from the recycled stream or you're recycling the products at the end of life so like a cordless drill uh, one of the main value propositions here is that the cordless drill may not necessarily be cheaper up front as far as the time or, or money it takes you to build. It'll be like, you know, 50 to 100 bucks, like a regular drill. But the difference is going to be on a lifetime. Here, if you can replace it, repair it, you're talking about not maybe like, say, two to five years or two to seven years that, uh, that professional cordless drills last. You're talking for as long as you like. So let's say 10x the efficiency on material use because you can always recycle or rebuild it uh, upgrade it as you like um, let's see what does a quick search uh, for average life of a professional cordless drill because for us for OSC case we know that the answer is as long as you like um, 
cordless drill. Life expectancy of a cordless drill. Let's see what they say. For brands like DeWalt or others. Let's see. Um, and, the, and the expensive ones, like for example here I'm reading the expensive ones. Well, that was in 2007, so it's a little dated. But several hundred dollars. Um, let's see, I'm not getting any numbers. I looked at this before. Anyone get anything? Any insight on that? Martin, you, you cut out just a little bit right, right, right at that last bit. Yeah, okay, that's because I'm, I'm searching online here. I'm asking, what is the average life of a cordless drill? Well, this guy yeah. here, is, he says, I am expecting to rebuy everything in 10 years. He's asking a question. Um... I've heard somewhere it was like two to seven years, uh, given like real professional use. And I know that the answer for factory farm is more like six months, uh, because whenever we have workshops, people drop the drills and you know, damage is very common. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's why I started thinking about that in the first place, because we were just like buying like 10 drills every year or something, which was, I thought it was ridiculous. Um, so for us, it's, we're definitely a good use case of, of a place where re repairability is a, is a great feature, um, and, but it, but it's like that for anything, anyone else. I mean, um, think about upgrading or modifying for as long as you like and so forth. So that's the, that's the idea. So that covers the. Uh, the incentive challenge part, so that's getting ready for that. Don't know, don't have a date for when it will kick off, but um, that's definitely major motion forward. So let's talk about collaborative product development. So with all this burbling up with John's um, manufacturing execution system, all this open source work, like Katrina and I are talking about, she's she's into uh, <clears throat> cosmetics like like such as well back back from her materials work uh, she's doing for example things like deodorant soaps uh, shower gels she's actually experimenting a little bit with that right now but uh, there's products like for example 3d printed uh, underarm protection or deodorant uh, container and all this stuff combines 3d printing and you've got some products on the top of that so that's one realm another realm is all kinds of mechatronics another realm is furniture everything you, know, you name it I mean, my claim is 80% of what's on Amazon if you have open source design and basic microfactory. But um, so so the thing I would call out for is uh, getting more attention to. So you can take a look at the page called Open Source Everything Store, basically a distributed enterprise where the question is how do you motivate people to to collaborate on doing that? Like how do you develop products openly? Well, first of all, you have to be radically open and, and accept that. Um, the kind of bravery that says, hey, we're actually giving this away to the world. But the idea would be that uh, people create this collaboratively. So this is a little template I drew up. But you can buy the product or you can buy pr the production of that product. What is that? That means you can get trained how to manufacture that too. Not only can you consume it, but you can also produce it. So once again, transitioning uh, the framework of society from consumers to more producers everywhere. Uh, along the concept of distributed market substitution. And there's huge products out there like Unilever making soap or whatever, the common products that uh, can definitely be done in a distributive way and therefore building local economies and substituting the great global so-called evil corporation um, because the way it works, I think a lot of times is when things get large, they tend to get unaccountable. So distributed enterprise is a good idea, but there's a huge environmental bend to that in that um, the current way I frame that is if you want to be an environmentalist, you should produce in your own community. And why? Because I believe that the only way we're going to get accountability for the natural 
materials, natural resources, as if they they come closer from from our communities, because then we see the effects we have on the environment. It's not somewhere far away where you don't see, but it's part of your life, so you have to take include or not externalize the environment as just part of the way things are. So that's why I think the case for distributed and local production, uh, in my view, is in inevitable because we cannot continue going as we are today with a lot of the uh, global annihilation through environmental, various environmental issues. So that's, that's the greater motivation here. Uh, but on the open source everything store, the question is, uh, I don't know if we, if we want to, during this meeting, maybe brainstorm a few ideas about the governance, because it really, uh, when we talk about the collaboration specification, how do we, how do we collaborate to do that? Uh, so first of all, we can start talking about that in our group here, then invite other people, but first get very clear about, okay, how is this going to work? And uh, I would propose that in order to involve any people, it has to be simple, low-hanging, kind of an enterprise. Uh, the way we can do it using modern distributed computer infrastructure is by embedding things. So so there's all kinds of software tools for for marketing or like your website to put your product on, your credit card processing or this or that, um, that can be treated as modules. And, and I would propose that if we start this in a massive way, the way it can scale is using very simple platforms. If you don't do anything dedicated, like um, if you don't want a dedicated platform, just start experimenting on a wiki, which is an infinitely, infinitely scalable platform. You can embed everything in there. So we can do mock-ups or prototypes on a wiki, and then different people can uh, set up by using different modules, set up their own stores. So it doesn't even have to be micromanaged. It could be a very wild thing. Now, of course, it has to some underlying uh, organization, some framework for it, but the least interference on the bureaucracy side, the, the better. Once again, that requires a very careful design of how you plan it all out or how, you know, how you would do that to make it work and to motivate people to actually contribute to this uh, rather than contributing to like right now, people might get hired. They, some company hires them. How would you get people to, to work in a public domain, in a public setting, where they're not hired by a company, but still the benefits are like that, that there's an infrastructure for how uh, you can actually generate revenue from that and actually spreads in the marketplace. So, so that question is not easy, and nobody has answered that to date on this planet. And I think uh, we can push some answers with the OSC design challenge and the cordless drill. That could be a great example of how we can perhaps push that forward to motivate a lot of people to collaborate. Um, but, you know, the potential of open source hardware has not in any way been achieved yet. So that's an outstanding thing. So, I mean, uh, yeah. with this open source everything, are you thinking like kind of a mixture between Craigslist and Amazon, but for yeah. open yeah. source, so you can start your own or Yeah. So the way the, okay. why, I, why I called open source everything store, uh, Amazon mm -hmm. calls itself the open, the it's not the open source, but it, it calls itself the everything store, right? So we yeah. have to break that. We have to break that into the open source everything store, because the mm -hmm. Facebooks and Amazons, if left unchecked, I think are quite dangerous for society, as some would say. For example, in 2016 election with Facebook and stuff like that. Um, so we have to distribute this kind of stuff, make it accessible, and this is the idea, and how you execute it is the, is the golden question. But yeah, it's, it's that, that uh, not only can you put your products up there, and I mean, the way it could work is that the resources there are truly free. Knowledge wants to be free, but we're, we're transitioning the knowledge wants to be free into economics wants to be free. Like really free enterprise, no monopolies. Just let's let's actually liberate economics too. So that's the promise. There. I, have you have you thought about um, like I guess tying these two ideas together? You know, like you want to incentivize people to develop, um, and you have a store. And so, like, have you thought about uh, some sort of like crypto, like OSC cryptocurrency yeah. that you can? developers with and they can spend money kind of in that environment yeah no absolutely i mean plenty of times but my opinion on that is uh there's a certain order to that like of course you can mm -hmm. kind of mix that a little bit but but the 
but the physical reality has to precede the cryptocurrency. Everyone for today sure. yeah. insists, for, for sure. right, right. Everyone today insists that first we're going to create the cryptocurrency and then we're going to create physical realities that support it. That's the that's the wrong way to think about it. And I, I mean, Bitcoin falls into that. Everyone falls into this trap. As far as I'm concerned, it's like, what is the phys like? I believe that uh, currency should be backed. That and the most tangible way to back it is, is by physical stuff. So, so if you have the open source everything store or or like the open source micro factory, we've got a global repository of of design that is super high quality, like professional grade goods for everything that the a industry yeah. actually draws from. With that, mm -hmm. you can start talking about new monetary systems and bypassing of the Fed. You know, right now yeah. we can't because we don't have an alternate reality. So, yeah, so I think the, the, uh, the idea of the, our own currencies, I mean, that's just part of the institutions that we have to transform, right? And it, that probably will happen pretty soon. But yeah, there's, a, there's an order to that, the sequencing, to how that should happen. Definitely on my radar, but, you know, like can't really get too excited about these things when when they're not starting with okay how do we create the physical realities like the proper way to do it's like okay let's think about a cryptocurrency but what is that thing that uh is driving the economy that's underneath that because you yeah, cannot have ether <laughs> and you know the name is suggestive like ethereum it's ether right um <laughs> so so we've got an issue there that we got to address mm. yeah so, I mean, there's a lot of, yeah, lots of very cool stuff, but the conversation with John just was actually quite encouraging because uh, I guess he was like the first person to really say, okay, bam, let's do it. And really, really co connecting to these ideas and actually potentially has the skills to actually do that with his engineering background. So that's really good. We just need more of that. We need more people like John to, with the skill sets to just simply get involved in working on the pieces. But the first thing that, of course, you have to have the open, open culture or that collaborative literacy that makes you do that in the first place. Because without that, uh, this is like completely foreign and impossible in one's mind, right? Like if you talk to someone yeah, no. from a century ago, no, they'd no. be like, "You're crazy," and most people think like you're crazy if you try to do this distributed stuff. Still, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, of course, of course, our parents are not there, um, right? My parents still ask me when I'm going to get a job, right? So <laughs> stuff like that. That's that's the reality. Um, yeah. So, uh, but very exciting stuff that's happening in this, and I think we can really do a lot to push it forward. And it's not as super distant as it seems. It's it's around the corner, I think. With um, if we really w w were to pay attention to the promise of open source, like for example, look at Ruslan, for example. I mean, he's working on logistics systems that are funded by the likes of Amazon, right? Well, it takes a few people like Ruslan, and, you know, there's John, there's ourselves, everybody put in the missing pieces of a, of a framework that is open source, not just benefiting some one funder, some one company that funds it. Uh, just like there's a lot of issues today with academia being corporate funded, where a lot of that knowledge you never ever see. You know, it's public institutions and all that stuff hides because comp companies uh, either playing don't publish or they publish stuff that's that's secure for them to publish because nobody will compete with them because they don't disclose the full information on how to do things. So right. there's definitely issues with academia. That's that's where the open science movement comes in, where people are saying, OK, everybody, first of all, should have access to the papers. Like right now, that's in our way. I cannot get access to a lot of papers that have cutting edge stuff that could be relevant to our work right that's yeah. that's a definite need that we need to address as we go forward as a society um, to liberate knowledge okay so there's those awesome things happening in the background so let's hear more about uh, other topics so John is working in the background um, yeah, maybe uh, Nathan will discuss with you. So actually, I'm printing the part right now. Let me actually okay. check where it is. But the thing that occurred to me, it's like, okay. Um, for one, I printed the thing out for Abitworks, but you guys all, we, we got to get our hands on the printers. And I think the framework to, 
to work with that with is, okay, let's think about a $250 printer. Do you guys have 250 bucks to spend on one? Because you can build one yeah. for that. Um, and therefore, what I would suggest is actually, so Abe, Abe and Nathan, take a look at where, let's take a look at where the D3D PVC is. Because I think you can get, I don't see why you cannot get very good performance with a PVC frame. Now, you might not get as, as good as what we do with metal, and you might not be able to go as fast, but for basic prototyping purposes, I think you should be perfectly fine. And you can go to a lower brow extruder, like, the, okay, so the yellow to this, the Titan Arrow, as I mentioned, I mean, that's a hundred bucks. And if you get the big, big nozzle, the, it's called the Super Volcano, that's another hundred bucks. So it's, there's like 200, actually close to 300. Um, in the extruder itself, if you go full professional grade, like high mm -hmm. throughput, but you can get a $20 extruder as well, which would be, you know, that's what we used initially. So there's different ways to do it. And for the, what I would say is for the PVC, let's finalize the design and maybe I could test print it and see if it's an actual real working product. Uh, so at least the corners, maybe like the PVC will let you guys, you know, get that in a hardware store, but the corners and everything as much as we can, we can 3D print that, including the attachments to the frame, which, um, I don't see that in today's meeting, so I'm going to go um, to my Facebook. Because the update on that, on the clamp, which clamps to the PVC, three-quarter inch PVC that Abe drew up, it's working, actually. So so what happened was, uh, so I, I tested it with with uh, three-quarter inch PVC as here. And um, so my Facebook, let me just paste it in, copy image and paste it in. Cool. Um, the thing is, it turned out that what I was using was a table leg that I thought it was three-quarter PVC, but actually wasn't. So, so when I tested it with what I know is definitely three-quarter inch PVC, because it's the white stuff, uh, that actually works well. And, and what I'm showing there is the one millimeter gap version. And the tight, the, the hole was pretty tight. Uh, you can spin that, like if you, if you take it, you can spin it on a PVC, but it's really hard to push it down. You can't push it down with its basic clamping force. Uh, and that's printed just 20%, so if you printed it more solid, it would probably get even more stiff, but I think 20% is fine enough. Um, so, Abe, let's see, let's maybe, um, how would you feel about kind of focusing a little more on a PVC version, as in like, let's get ready for a build of that? Or do you want to build a PVC version? That's what I've been looking at. Um, let's see, I posted a bunch of photos. Actually, I was just looking at your, your photos a lot there because they answered a lot of questions I was still having about um, the CAD because the CAD, I think, was a little bit rougher, and then you uh, see your, your mock-up there. Yeah. Um, but but I, I was just kind of looking in rough uh, on my CAD. I think I that updated. I just kind of threw that overhead concept in there. Uh, uh-huh. Just how that would work out on the PVC. So it's taking measurements and seeing where it might. Uh, I just keep looking at, at different points where things might hit or adapt patients to the parts maybe a little. And I was kind of seeing that it looks like, I mean, that, that metal frame is, is one inch wide. And so I figured that the three quarter inch PVC should be a little bit smaller, actually. Although uh, uh, I think it's actually. Uh, I think the total diameter on that is a little bit larger, actually, because it's point, um, point 0.5. I can try and remember it. I think it's uh, a pretty significant diameter on that side of the PVC, but it, it shouldn't be that hard to adapt. I think uh, so far, assuming can get, uh, like we were talking about the extruder hitting the top of that metal there. I was looking at that earlier. I didn't realize how the motor was kind of mounted up above and all that. So. Mm -hmm. That requires obviously changes. Although I see yeah. more what you put out, the bed being raised up. Yeah. Um, expecting to make that many changes on this, but I guess you know it's nice to keep them consistent between the printers. If that that's a better way to do yeah. it for pretty much all of the frames designs in general, that that's going to make less volume. It'd be good to keep it consistent. 
So right. the thing I see immediately is the angle brackets. Uh, they have to be a little bit, um, I'll say, taller. Uh, I think they have to come down at least a, a quarter inch longer. Uh, you call them the uh, the X Y angle brackets, I think. Yeah. The, that, that overhead X. I think those have to be. I'd have to, at least a quarter inch uh, longer to mount to the the frame on the for, with the PVC middle because those clamps they're not designed to go up on the corners right they just go right below the corners and so that actually sets it down a little bit lower that's usually there i mean i guess the clamps could be i don't know if it could be re that easy to redesign the clamps to go on the corner part that oh, would wow. be a lot more trouble i'm not sure that that would um, work very well plus we might end up needing huh. uh multiple designs of the clamps like a clamp version that goes on the the pipe part and then on the corner it would be different so um yeah i just put the excess yeah. in, the in there and i'm just trying to eyeball what what would work and what would not well, uh, it's well. not i well i actually i raised it up i think an eighth of an inch and i just i'm, I'm just looking at it so i think it uh, there, I think that the uh, carriage currently is just skimming the top of the pipes, um, or, well, it's even with the top of the pipe, I think, and so I think I think it needs to come up a little higher just to avoid some things hitting. But uh -huh. uh, the only thing I see right now, I'm sure there's a bunch of other issues, is that X Y angle bracket would need to be a little bit um, taller in the Z direction, the way it mounts there. Um, right. I think I get a little better from your photos of the actual uh, mock-up you did. Uh, some of the stuff I wasn't understanding in the CAD, so that's that's good. But uh, yeah, I guess yeah, just, just um, issues like you said with the hot end hitting the um, uh -huh. the hot end potentially hitting, which is, I guess that that's prevented though by the um, well, it should be. Fairly preventable by the end stops, right? Well, I guess there's one end stop. Well, but. yeah, yeah, that that is completely preventable. Yeah. I'm saying when you're in a failure mode, I want don't want to create the chance of breakage. Yes, the end stops will address that. But imagine you're you don't have your end stop. You don't want to lose your a break off your extruder uh, heater block and then have a pain using a screw extractor trying to you know extract that threaded part that's in there uh, so by design we have to design it so it's impossible uh, under fault condition for it to break uh, but now one easy solution here all we could do is have one plate that's simply the uh, it can literally be one of the um, you know a half piece of the Okay, let me actually do that, like, right now. No, I can't. Uh, but if I... Okay, so, are you seeing my screen? Yes. Okay, so if you look at my screen, all you need to do is use, for example, this is the carriage piece here. Take one clamshell, one of two, so this is a clamshell made of two pieces. Take one clamshell and use that as a vertical extender. And that'll be your solution. Oh. If you don't so want to that, add any other parts. Oh, I think I think in that CAD, let's see, it looks like the clamp isn't all the way up against the corner. And that's true too. Why. So you're almost like really reaching. Yeah. I guess I need to I yeah. need to push it. And then remember we talked about the corner pieces possibly being inserted into the pipes. Remember? Not not the pipes go into the corner piece, the corner piece goes into the pipe. So that okay. the diameter is not different and therefore you don't need any additional that's, pieces to make this work. That's true. I didn't um I don't I don't know if I heard that before. So yeah, we can 3D print a different corner that inserts yeah. into the pipe pieces. Yes. Okay. Yes. That would change the diameter of those. They could be kept the same diameter. That that would be interesting. Yeah. So that should be no, that would be really print. cool. 
Uh, the cool thing about this is that because the clamps are adjustable vertically, you can get like perfect alignment without having to worry about where the screw holes are, you know, because there are no screw holes. Yeah. 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 And the corners that changes that he's there initially, of course, yeah, it would be nice if the corners snap together. Well, because initially, obviously, it, when you're prototyping this stuff, you want to be able to take it apart and rework things and change mm -hmm. things. Um, and of course, eventually, I was thinking of trying to fill it with stuff to stiffen things. I'm interested to try some stuff with that, um, if that affected it. Because yeah, I'm curious to hear how. Mm, what what this? I think the only thing that's really affected by the the flexibility of the frame is probably the speed. So yeah, it'll be interesting yeah. to see. The speed is so, shaky. So I've been thinking about that. The, my thoughts from before are so so make all these parts hollow, right? So then at the end, like when you're building your frame, you can drill say a half inch hole or like a three quarter inch hole in one of the corner pieces and have plaster of Paris that you just pour down with a funnel and it fills the entire frame, you probably would need a little deep hole at the bottom to let the air out. But basically, stand the, stand the frame up at a 45 degree angle uh, on one corner and basically pour into the opposite corner on the top. So you have a completely solid frame. That's yeah, and there's probably ways. Um, yeah, we could print the 3D corner so they have a hole. Yeah. Um, we could print other parts and make it so they have holes and then plug the holes with little plugs that we print or something. But yeah, that, yeah, you could, you could do that. Um, um, yeah, you could assemble so, the whole frame and then pour it afterward if there yeah. are air holes. In there. Although, yeah, you, I would pour into each corner or something. Yeah, you could, you could do that. That would be easier because um, you're talking about like how liquid that substance that you're going to be pouring in there is and will it sort of like only, yeah. And, of course, if you could put more aggregate or fill or something in it, that you would use less of the, the, the plaster Paris or whatever it is. But, um, yeah. 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 I don't think that I helps. Mean, but, check this one yeah. out. Like, what about, like, rough sand that's got definite that's, air spaces in it, and then you just pour concrete, like liquid cement paste. They'll just yeah, blend everything they, up. I've, I've experienced pumping um, stuff like, yeah, they, I know that they actually pump <laughs> they pump uh, different plaster materials with sand mixes in, in floors and buildings and so on. So they, there's probably different mixtures you can do that pour pretty easy. Yeah, yeah, no, that would be some cool innovation here. So um, publish it on a wiki so nobody can patent it, and then we're good to go. Yeah, I'm going to keep um, looking at that top because... Uh, Got to see what what uh, changes. I I don't think that modifying that bracket is is going to affect anything uh, on the other. So I think I'll just modify that and extend it down. Um, and I'm not sure. Let's see. I, I, a lot of the holes and stuff I see in your CAD because I've got that open too. Still looking at that. Uh, some of those things there, it looks like they're they're scale different or or sizes. Some things don't line up. But I, it's, it's yeah, just rough CAD. I'm not um, using any assembly. I'm just using by eye aligning things. Yeah, and that journal works pretty good. Um, those, actually, I'm curious. I'm gonna have to look at the end stops again. I know it doesn't look like you updated anything recently in there. It no. Look like the history. No, it's back to the real thing. Um, those end stops you got snapped on there. Yeah. I guess there's they just snap on one rail. Is that? Yeah, yeah. just exactly like this one here. Okay. Are they? Hmm. Yep. You've tested and, those, or yeah, yeah, they they work well. Works great. Okay, okay, so um, they don't like move around. No, or... they're stiff. I I made that hole from the original file just slightly smaller. The guy had it. The source file had it, like eight millimeters. I put it down to like seven point nine or something like that, and and it's just okay. way tighter. So yeah, now it's pretty stiff. To, if they move or something. Oh, over time, it is it gets bumped. Uh, I was thinking, it, I don't know. You, you could make it go. I was thinking it'd probably be. You could make it go so that it snaps across both rails somehow. But you can, but the building. belt's in a way. Yeah, I'm oh, not well, sure what right. you gain from it. But look at that. Gotcha. Here's the real picture. That's... This works great. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. 
and now we're using the two wires. Uh, I actually had to reverse. There was a setting in Marlin. I had to change. This was. I had to set inverting and stop to like reverse it from true to false or false to true or something. Because the way it's set up right now, I just had to make this little upgrade in Marlin. But not a big deal. Yeah. So let's see. You're saying uh, for kits for for starting the prototype or test these, you were saying it was like uh, over a couple hundred bucks or something. What yeah. kind of kit setup? Um, I, I know you get, did some research on that before. What kind of? Because uh, I guess like you said we get PVC pipe from the stores, but what kind of um, kit? Uh, did you have a listing of that kind of thing from before? I can't yeah. remember. Yeah, so it's a simple uh, page called it Simple 3D Printer Bomb. Oh, okay. So take a look at that. And what would be useful is maybe uh, take your design and understand where each of those parts fits. So go through that. Yeah, um, yeah there's probably some new 3D printed parts that, that need to be included, right, uh, for changes um i know i'm not sure i get all the um i, I see you've got different let's see i can look at your photos again there's, there's a bunch of plates that go around the extrude there's two plates i should say that go around the the carriage for the extruder mount it looks like the whole, oh yes it didn't look like the line up there so i was trying to figure out what um have you tested Let's see. Oh, it that's like that's well that tested. So, take a look at um, the picture. No, the CAD is it's exactly as it is in the CAD. So that means, let's see, what do you see in the CAD? You see the motor bracket, right? Yeah, but okay, but hold on. That's with the Titan Arrow, which I'm not sure you want to go right to the Titan Arrow because it's too expensive. Oh. Um, so, if you do a regular some other type of uh, an extruder like from before the thing that does work well is a bracket like this where you're attaching through the faceplate because otherwise what we have done before is that holder where you're just holding the back of the motor that's fine too but it won't work in this case because now you've got this overslung design ah okay and here's the other thing in the overslung design unfortunately you'd have to go to underslung because the extruder tip is not going to reach below the below your carriage here we're using the volcano heater block so you'd have to use something with a longer heater block in order for it to reach below the carriage that it's sitting on you see yeah okay. but yeah, besides part. that the double plate like you see there yeah that's exactly what i'm doing it's a plate on the bottom that's just a flat plate oh. and it's, yeah on those plates, there's three holes there. They yep. don't um, seem to line up. Uh, the bolts go through those through. They just go around the, the outside of the carriage. Is that the idea? Um, they don't, what I was wondering, they don't line up with um, where there's. Oh, I guess. Well, they line the up rod, with each other. They, they span yeah. on the outside of the carriage, okay. but they go right through each other, right? Yeah, as long as they miss the, the rod there. They do. Uh, it's so let me close. Show you. See, look at it. That's the top view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you see a yeah. slight little interference. It's a slightly up, but it works. It's uh, it's just like that. The the carriage is just touches the the three millimeter bolts that go in there. Okay. So using three millimeter bolts plus nylon lock washers that make it firm, and the washer is not going to come off. So tiny three millimeter. Yeah lock washer which in production engineering terms i do not like three millimeter bolts or nuts or whatever they're tiny you can hardly get them in your hand right so you need to use um, use like pliers are... to hold the it's it's just so tiny i would in the future like i, I have it in as three millimeters right now but in the future i'm going to work towards getting that to like six millimeters because this is too the, tiny the hole and yeah. bolt size yeah. Are those really bigger there? Because I see the main thing I see is it looks like there's potential interference through the the rod. It would scrape the rod on that uh, yeah. bottom left corner. Yeah, you're right. You are right. So we have to address that. Yeah. 
Yeah, it can be hitting the rod there because the rod is moving. It's moving past the rod. So yeah, but this this as is yeah, I guess you picked that out. Yeah, right here it would be rubbing, but it's just slightly off that because you can move that forward a little bit. That sandwich you can yeah. get that sandwich, move it forward. Can all be adjusted. So yeah, and th those are just three D printed plastic plates, I assume. Yes, they are. Holes. Oh uh, yeah, you got to print. So for example, in D three D nineteen oh two. You've got um, part library. You've got there's the E3D Titan bracket, so that's the bracket for the Titan. It would fit any other extruder too, though. Uh, but it, you probably need to undersling it. So okay, so that that's actually a big change. Uh, if you're no. not using the Titan with the long volcano heater block. Or if you're just not using the volcano heater block, you're not going to reach below the, the carriage. Therefore, you have to put your extruder underneath. Now, why? what's the difference between the two? The difference is that if you put it below, the, the extruder is going to be farther away from the, car from the axes. So there's a more leverage. Therefore, it will wobble just a little bit more on you because it's not as tightly constrained to the axis. The farther away from the axis, tiny wobbles on the axis are gonna be, a, be magnified by a long lever arm. So in this case, why I like the one on top is that the extruder tip is very close to the actual rods. So it's really nice and tight and firm without much cantilevering. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, that does look like it'd work well. Which so, means that we get higher high-speed performance, but it's not critical at low speeds. Yeah, so the, and that's why you've propped the, the bed up higher. Um, yeah, I had to do some it. Some of those other... Yeah. Yeah, it yeah I guess it could be done on the uh, other versions as well. That way, the same plastic parts. Um, so... Yeah, I guess the other way to, to, to mount the motor, you're saying underneath if you've got a shorter block. Well, hmm. I guess there's some things, well, there's some things not drawn with the extruder there. But yeah, that, that volcano block, yeah, I'm used to seeing it uh, as a longer. But I guess the, the, the difference between the volcano and maybe the other uh, D3D or whichever uh, blocks or heat, hot ends you're using is the the volcano was hotter is that it mostly the and idea there is that because the heater cartridge is vertical like the path where you're heating is longer the other way you have it turn 90 degrees and it's going through the thin side so there's just more distance where you're getting the heat when you're melting the filament so it can melt more it's vertically okay, oriented yeah. as opposed to like horizontal orientation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've looked yeah. at some of that E3D design stuff before, but yeah, I can remember. Yeah, because let's see, I recall that the hole, yeah, the hole where the um, next to the nozzle, the vertical hole next to the nozzle is the temperature sensor, I think, right? So there's two holes. One is the, the thermistor, another one is the heater cartridge itself, which is a resistor. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, and they've got some holes on it. Yeah, I don't know what the, uh, hmm. Yeah, I guess you have to think about the advantages and price differences on those. Um, don't mind, I guess for myself, I wouldn't mind having a, a good printer uh, that would do everything. But, you know, it's good to test the, um, I'd be interested to test the uh, PVC frame as well. So, uh, did I mention. You know, Last time, did I mention the scalable heater block? I don't recall. I think, okay, this is new. I didn't even mention this, but when, uh, so, so I just got the super volcano, which is 150 bucks. That's insane. It's essentially a 25 cent piece of aluminum that they sell for $150. So, um, so I was thinking, okay, let's do, uh, how about we do scalable designs of this? 
Uh, so I posted this on the RepRap forum too to get feedback. But basically, the idea is why not just stack two of them or three or four or five or how many you like. Practically, you probably can do two or three. Uh, but you're basically using the Volcano blocks and just connecting them together with M6 threaded brass. So you look at that, but basically, it, there you go. Uh, don't pay 100 50 pay you know 250 pay two dollars and50 cents for the volcano which you can get from China and put a few of those together uh, so take like in this cat here take two of these or three of these blocks and then you connect them together and then you put individual heater elements into each block how's that There's nothing so wrong that's with it. to give you a longer melt zone. Yeah, that's called going from 40, 40 watts to 80 watts uh, at a cost of $5 okay. as opposed to $150. Because the only one that's available off the shelf is the $150 E3D, right? So here yeah, you can I do that for $5. I some of the stuff I saw about E3D before. It also sounded like they're also trying to shorten the path. Uh, because I guess there's issues with that. Like, I guess it's mostly shortening the path of the filament before it melts. I guess after it melts. Okay, you're talking about that. a different concept. Uh, the concept you're talking about is about printing flexible filaments, where you want to reduce the path length after you're driven, after you do the drive wheel. you are got to reduce the path to the point where it comes out the nozzle. So that's, yeah, that's the other thing. That's the thing I was... Uh, I think I, I mentioned a little bit about the rubber extruder, right? Uh, the mm -hmm. other, other time? Um, yes. But I don't... Wait, I don't think I even... Um, let's see. Let's see what we have for rubber extruder. I didn't talk about that at last meeting, did I? You mentioned it. I mentioned it, but actually, did I show a diagram? Mm, I don't think so. Okay, so I, I started working on a diagram of that because this is, I think we've got to do it. Um, so let's see this um, rubber extruder, see if I can find it. I want to show that point because that's actually a good development point. Rubber, why am I not finding it? It was under... Flexible, rubber, flexible. I don't know why it's escaping me right now. Um, there's scalable heater block, and then. Oh, I, I don't know. I might have been just doodling in my notebook. But the idea there was... Yeah, maybe I never even put this... I typically work it on my Google Docs. But uh, the idea there is, uh, Abe, to address your comment. And let's maybe look at the... Let's look at the actual CAD to show what we're talking about. Because that will be better. Okay, so if you see this here... In the in the Titan arrow, you've got and you know, we should be looking at the real real one. But there's a drive, there's a gear like a larger gear thumb wheel that's attached to this upper right hole, and the drive gear is like the part that actually drives the filament is approximately like right there upper towards the upper right that leaves you all this distance you see where the extruder is the heater block is it gives you all that distance it still has to travel so the redesign of this would be where the driving part is on the lower right to minimize that distance so get it as close to the as low and as close to the heater block as possible. The Titan Arrow does the opposite. Instead of the, the, the drive part being low, it's high. 
And it's because of their design, how they do it. So that to accommodate for that, what they do is they have this neck, this confining neck that sticks up to constrain the filament. Now that is not as good as just, just shortening the path and getting rid of even to need to constrain the filament because it's going right into the heater block. So that's that's the distinction there. And we need to do that because this extruder is not designed for it. And I have no data on what what is the actual rubber throughput rate, which I mentioned. We're going to need to do 20 pounds a day. I'm going to print tires. I need to do 20 pounds a day. 5, 10, 20 pounds a day. Uh, I don't know if we can... I don't think we can do that with um, this extruder right now. Might get... Well, it depends also what kind of rubber, because there's all kinds of rubber. There's very hard rubber and there's very soft rubber. You would not possibly be even able to do very soft rubber. Um, durometer 60, you, you wouldn't be able to do it. Um, this would just fail, it would just kink up and wouldn't get pushed through. So that's, that's the rubber stuff. Now, as far as the heater block itself, as long as you get it in there, and then you want to use, once again, 3 millimeters as opposed to 1.75, because 1.75 will kink up on you much more than a three millimeter, naturally, because it's thinner. Yeah, to get that many pounds through it, I was thinking you need to go to a much larger uh, system anyway. Well, so the, the data from the super volcano shows 20 pounds a day. They've got data on it. That's for regular filaments. It's not for rubber. So that's actually a, a somewhat of a blessing that's great right like there's already a known solution for 20 pounds a day proven so we don't need to innovate on that that's there and that meets like industrial productivity on a small scale so that opens up a lot thinking about uh even to the point where you can be taking scrap plastic mixing it 50 50 with like wood residues or like sawdust can be how about 3d printing um wiki house parts the parts that they usually get out of plywood which is 20 bucks a sheet of plywood 20 or 30 bucks a sheet of plywood so this could be a way to get the recycling stream and wood waste stream to build construct real construction materials so the only update i can say on that is I thought about, okay, let's print some glazing material, some plastic lumber. Well, how about we print entire 4 by 8 panels? Like I'm printing right now the, for the tiny model. We just scale it up, print the whole thing in multiple materials. So you've got the structure, you've got the glazing part, you've got rubber gaskets, all in one print. How would that be? That sounds pretty exciting, right? Uh, that's possible with your... Uh, so we have to do some of that. That requires that you have low-cost access to materials processing infrastructure at that level where you're printing large things it becomes a material handling issue material handling and processing so it's beyond the thing that you do on your desktop where you just buy yourself a roll of filament uh, if you were to do this with off-the-shelf filament each module would be like a thousand dollars because filament is ten bucks a pound and the module like the one we use for the greenhouse let's say it weighs 50 pounds Okay, so 50 times 100, uh, 50 times 10, that would be $500. $500 for a module. And so if you go to the waste stream, then you can get that at low cost. Um, yeah, so, so there's development needed there. There's a lot of development there. So that's why we're working on a larger printer and all the stuff, this is like the prelude to getting professional grade quality that anybody can build. Scaling this up is the next step. Getting the larger heater blocks, including rubber ability in this system. It's a summary of the, the roadmap on that. But with that, you can get, you're talking about major distribution of productivity that's possible. Now, is it gonna happen? It's up to us. Okay, so that's that, um, Abe. So, let's see, Nathan. Um, I would uh, say maybe Nathan and, and Abe. 
maybe pivot a little bit to, to the point where you can get your build a printer so you can do the prototyping without have me being the bottleneck yeah yeah for sure that's that's the uh, that's the idea i'm i maybe even have to uh, san francisco so yeah. i like i'm figuring out work work situations and living situations and everything like that but i think i should have something you know a space where i can set up a 3d picture by by next month yeah yeah it should be good now alex and sarah are out there and they have printers so oh cool. them, right? okay yeah you know, just reach out to, to Alex. I think he's enough. Reach out and, and see if, uh, since you're connected to the dev team, they, they haven't been on a dev team. They, you know, they kind of started doing their own thing at this point. But yeah. get them engaged back in this, then you can make some progress. Yeah, definitely. I'll, I'll, I'll reach out to Alex today. Yep. Okay. Bye. Um... Wait. Yeah, and Abe, as far as... Uh, the bottleneck, I guess what you're saying, I know before you're doing plans, you, you have the website and stuff set up for doing like kits, different versions of kits of printers, but I said that, that you're saying it's a bottleneck for you to do that, because uh, I know that that takes a lot of time, and you're probably the only one building those, right? So right. you said the idea is to just be able to use the bomb to, to order the parts so that uh, it's not like a kit that's taking up your time to put together? I can help out, but what I would suggest is do some prep work, like understand it thoroughly so that what I would suggest, maybe the next steps, uh, can you do like where you take a, do like a visual bomb off of this thing. So for every single part, maybe um, do, a, you know, put it into a Google Doc and then point to the part and point to a link in the build material so that it's transparent what, if everything is there. And it would be useful if you actually added some more details, like, okay, add the end stops in there, like a few more of the details, like for example, the build plate, get it to be a complete professional grade design. And professional grade means that it's not missing anything. Um, as opposed to like a bunch of little details missing that make it actually not work at the end of the day. Right. So, for yeah, example, and that was my plan was yeah. to get it um, yeah. finished, but I'm trying to change uh, certain I mean, parts, and I think that yeah, yeah there's I still can lot ship of you some changes. stuff. Like, I've got a bunch of stuff here, so we can talk about that. But like, really understand what you need. Like, for example, here on the platform, you can very well easily do with a little uh, eighth-inch steel plate. You don't need the heated bed if you're going to print PLA on blue tape, that works really well, you know? So for basic prototyping, like for example, I had the, the I made 3d printer here that I was working with or testing for its quality. Uh, that just has P that has no PI. It doesn't have a heated bed and it simplifies it quite a bit. Um, so, you know, do that. So draw that plate in and draw how you're going to support it. Uh, fill in some of the missing pieces, but you're going to have to go back to the underspung. So that's the change you're going to have to make. Uh, you can, If you want me to ship you uh, one of our old extruders, I can do that. Um, so, I mean, I, I mean, I'll just ship you all the stuff at the, the cost of materials, which shouldn't be too much, you know. Um, and it will work, but... It's not something you're going to go like professional grade. It's, it'll be good experimental and doing basic prototyping, uh, which is acceptable. But for example, like with a small MK8 extruder that we used before, you're not really going to be able to do much on rubber or whatever. Or you'll, ha you'll be able to do things, but just much slower, you know. But it'll, I think still will be a very useful, useful experience. Because then you can see some of the limits. You'll see, like, okay, now we can upgrade this. In fact, the other thing I was going to ask, uh, remember I shipped a kit over to um, to Roberto some time ago, and then pretty soon after that he just disappeared off the team. Should we just ask him to ship it back to you guys, to you, Abe, in particular? Uh, maybe. I actually thought I saw some activity from Roberto oh, on did? the wiki a while back. Which okay. I was surprised because, um, yeah, I haven't seen him in a while. Right. But he might have actually posted something on the wiki sometime back. So, 
Um, yeah, not yeah. sure what he's, he's doing with that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm kind of, uh, I guess, torn. I, I understand some of the extruder and stuff like that about the, the overall build, and, and in some ways, a, like a printer that, um, if I'm going to invest in a printer, I wouldn't mind having the good quality parts and stuff that's, you know, uh, what's being worked on. Um, I think some of the stuff, but you know, for the frame, I wouldn't. You know, testing the frame is a good way to to learn some of the stuff and start out. And you can always change parts later because I, I expect the main difference is going to be that the speed will have to be slower with the plastic frame. But um, you know, there's I, I wouldn't mind having maybe a, a decent uh, extruder. But either way, what's what's ever good to test? You know, they. Obviously, these things last, so they can always be, can always change to different parts. Um, um, and it'd be nice to have something, hopefully that that you know works good. Uh, the box, because because if other people see it and you can kind of talk about it, then other people would be interested as well. There's uh, so yeah, I'm not sure which parts are uh, are, are the most reasonable. Okay, but, uh, here's a comment on that approach, and that is um, one way to treat this is that you're going to optimize the hell out of the this inexpensive version to make it literally as good as the steel version. That's a possibility. Because if you, if you yeah. get into all the tricks of exactly what's required to do that, like, for example, you fill the frame with concrete, or whatever you do. I, I mean, I even wondered if you could put steel in the frame, but I think that kind of, I don't think it would work as good, and you might as well make the frame out of steel, right? Um, well, I mean, you can, cons like, if you call it rebar, then there's not no problem with rebar. Yeah, but that will, you put, if rebar is cheap, you put small rebar inside the pipes, but um, I don't know. I mean, do you end up having to, like, Hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know. I but see, those are. I don't know. Yeah. Well, look. I mean, so, those are valid R and D questions. Like, can, like basically, you can say, can I maybe rework the frame so maybe you even use larger tubes, and you work out the perfect thickness of rebar because rebar only comes so small. Like I think the minimum is a quarter. Um, yeah. But then if you actually make it work really well, that could be an innovation that says, wow, here's how you can actually super reinforce a plastic frame so you literally have a steel plastic concrete composite. I mean, you can treat it as a research project on many aspects that are really valuable. Because um, like the, the experiment could be, okay, making 3D printed, like for example, think about a heavy duty CNC machine that's made this way that you're you're using plastic you're putting rebar inside it and filling it with concrete can that truly scale that would be pretty magical if it did and I don't see why that wouldn't actually be even very practical because they do make concrete based heavy duty CNC machines in fact a lot of them do that and in fact the most most precise ones are made of mo granite like when you talk about air bearing making cnc machines they're made of granite for the flatness yeah the surface. i so, think about different frame stuff and around the tube should be pretty efficient um but we could obviously 3d print any sort of frame that kind of gets more to like different extrusion shapes or something but i know too sometimes well to look at the i'm not too familiar with the map but i know sometimes certain structures like i-beam shapes and structures which i don't know how you'd interconnect any of that but sometimes certain structural shapes are um they hold loads better yeah. uh, for like the top part or something but that that probably makes the assembly more complex or you right. end up 3d printing some strange parts yeah but, but yeah i, I mean think you... about what would be no, exciting for you to do? Yeah, so if, if the um, extruders are really a limitation, uh, I guess the, the simpler extruder would uh, be better because it sounds like, um, well, 
I would think that having the larger nozzle size, I think, would be the better thing, as long as the because that that it's a test um, the the speed of extrusion. It, are the um, other cheaper extruders usually have the nozzle size, or is that something that's more uh, commonly the used on like the volcano? Or... I'm not sure if they use the MK8 with with the volcano, but you can do. Um... I mean, it's, the only thing we have done is the MK8. Let's see, does can M, Google, can MK8 um, use Volcano I'm kind nozzle? of assuming that the larger 3 millimeter filament, because that's the biggest, right, it, it may require more heat, right, I mean, to melt it fast enough, right, and extrude faster. So... And part of the, I guess the heat, it is part part of the speed there. And yeah, uh, like you're saying, you, you could stack multiple heaters, but I wonder, wonder how stacking heaters in series. That's all to be determined. Uh, I mean, that, this that's is... a complicated thermal thing. So yeah, I mean, it's it's how fast some of those. It's cool. Yeah, and it, like you said, that having it closer, an end of the nozzle closer to the act access is obviously a big benefit there so yeah I know they're so like they're trying to scale up the heaters to higher wattages too and I saw some stuff about hotter beds which I guess if you combine some of those things in an enclosed option that helps you print yeah. a lot of the stuff without yeah. dumping as much heat see the, the extruder is kind of the missing part which makes so for a high performance printer, the extruder is definitely like a missing link, I would say, in an open source world. Because you gotta go to these expensive ones. The M like the Prusa uh I mean the MK eights, I mean a lot of those people don't care about the, the fast speed, so that's a pe that's a realm that's not really getting pushed far. Because nobody's doing like nobody wants to print furniture. Everyone, you know, is happy with their desktop little printer. So, yeah, that's that's a limit. But that's so. There's Neil in Canada working, it's open sourcing the simple MK8 extruder, which I, I would do that. I would uh, learn how to build that. See, because one way you can think about it is if you develop a good version of this, that's the low brow. Think about it as that helping many other people who want to get into this at a low entry level. So I think that okay. For, on one side, we've got industrial productivity with the main. Um, D3D 1902 with the E3D expensive extruders, but it's also very useful to have a low cost experimental version like um, that actually works really well. And then then the excitement there goes about okay, how well can we make it perform even though it is so inexpensive? And then then you can make yourself like once we so right now we can mill aluminum with a D3D CNC circuit mill. That's doable. We can be making our own extruders right now. So I would say if you have the energy for that, think about it that way that, okay, I'm going to do a cheapo printer and then I'm going to use further technological recursion to get a, a high performance extruder that is cost you a few dollars because you now you learn how to make it yourself and, and open source those plans. So we, we got to be doing the tech recursion where we start building that equipment because like right now man yeah the price on those extruders and a, and a big heater blocks is simply prohibitive well business as usual it's not prohibitive but to get the real diffusion and real widespread adoption it certainly limits it you can't i mean with with 150 dollars for just the heater block how many people are going to do that right now you know not a lot it just closes that door for a lot of people um, so. Yeah, for printing small parts, I, I can see the the cheaper stuff is good enough. Right. And at low speed, that that's fine. And obviously, the plastic frame, even if we get it stiffer, it's just not going to likely scale to two feet or anything like that. Uh, um, Twelve inches is probably, you know. Yeah, enough. but I don't agree with that. What if you? Um, no, no. What if you do like two inch PVC and rebar in it? Why? Why could that not yeah. work? Yeah. What if you do plastic uh, metal composites? 
plastic concrete composites. I, I don't see why not. You know how they pour the footers for houses in those those uh, cardboard tubes? Yes. Yeah, if a house, if you can put a house on a fiber concrete composite, we can build a 3D printer like that. Yeah, that's sure the material in there. I mean, be you just, that's, that to me is the um, innovation that we got to be doing. Just do ridiculously crazy stuff at a ridiculously low cost. That I think is is exciting. Yeah, I, I assume that concrete and steel it has a certain amount of deflection, uh, and vibration even at lengths. But well, yeah, the concrete, but the rebar concrete mix is a well proven engineering method that combines the best features of tensile strength and hardness, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it handles so, compression and everything well. Yeah. 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 Um, and I know they do all kinds of, yeah, I mean, they do all kinds of stuff with it, pre-stressed concrete and suspension bridges. Yeah. On. I don't know how to apply that to uh, to this stuff, but, um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see how it behaves in, in a piece of pipe. Yeah. So, But think about it, I mean, uh, think about it this way. You're, you're taking, you've got a thin shell that you print out just enough so you can hold the rebar and co and then pour the concrete in there. So, basically, you're basically... 3D printing yourself rebar holders in the form of a cubic shape. And then you pour into the, the actual plastic and you get a super solid, super low cost kind of a frame using this technique. I mean, that is that to me is like, I think that's some significant innovation right there. If you can show that a 3D printer can get you a, this amazingly strong structure uh, as a 3D printer base, I mean, you're getting the, the complex part is getting the geometry, right? The 3D printer does it. The rest is pouring brute force concrete and re using rebar. So that's a, yeah, I, guess I think there's a lot of innovation. It's done there. right. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I think that's that's not something to sneeze at. I think that, that would be significant innovation for uh, low cost uh, design. Of scalable CNC systems. Yeah, I noticed. Uh, let's see, you were talking about the uh, pretty large-scale sheet materials yeah. and, and machining that kind of stuff. Yeah. I noticed them the other day that there's for some old stuff they did. Um, I think it's more for machining, subtractive stuff. Yeah. Because I don't know how you do 3D printing, but kind of like the hang printer concept, except for with certain milling machines. Instead of having a large gantry system, uh, you make a small portable system that moves across the material, and then you have it figure out its its uh, position in three-dimensional space and things like that, which I guess requires you know marking and, and things like that. But that at some point you kind of need to you might as well scale uh, instead of trying to scale a gantry system. At some point you might as well try something like that. But I don't know how complicated. There's probably no open source software for that. I'm I'm not sure. Whole different project. I'm sure if you develop it, you can make it work. There's going to be limits and advantages. It's just another thing. Yeah. If you have a system like that, you can tell right now that you're going to be limited to how much force you can enact because you lift yourself and stuff like that. So, yeah, that's a concept. But for, like for example, the yeah, the hang printer, with the hang printer you couldn't do contact machining, for example, right? You can't suspend something like that on a string. So you can do non-contact uh, work like 3D printing with the hang printer. So what is that thing, that, that CNC uh, router that's suspended by chains? That's yeah, that's a similar thing, one, but it's limited. I saw one, yeah. oh, the one on plywood. Is yeah. that the one you're talking yeah. about? But you can only do okay, so much yeah. and so fast before it jumps off the, the plywood. And what got me thinking about that again the other day was I saw one of these 3D printing people on YouTube uh, reviewing a, um, I think it was a smart router, but it was kind of a collaborative robot where the human moves the router around, but the computer keeps you from making mistakes. It kind of does it for you. Yeah. So yeah, it's got so, like uh, a easy system on the internally, and it moves the head around. Not that's a subtractive machine, but 
Yeah. I know they've had like hover hover printers and things like that for years for doing large scale uh, printing giant signs and, and and things like that on the floors of huge warehouses. So I, I the technology obviously exists, but um, some of that it, it's for much larger scale, probably even than we want to go four by eight sheets. Yeah, but, yeah, different technologies. Uh, reasons to. Uh, uh, it'd be nice if there if there's some open source software that would scale that way, but I'm not sure. Yeah, that. that's you know th those are whole big development projects towards which there's not a lot of open source prior art. Like you know we're working with this 3D printer stuff because all of that is coming out of the RepRap project, right? So you got a lot of that ready to pick from, especially like Marlin that's all there to do all kinds of applications, including Marlin that could be used for CNC milling. Some people that do that too, so. Yeah. Okay. Um, I got to get going here because actually the internet guys are here, as I mentioned. But let's see. Do we cover everything for today? Anything else? Yeah, I think we covered a lot. So. Yeah. Um, we'll keep in touch with the, the printer uh, part development here, and yeah, I'll look over the the bomb for the symbol printer and, and figure yeah. out because obviously there's a bunch of 3d parts i guess we would rely on you printing uh so that would be the majority of uh the work on that yeah there Otherwise, yeah i can i can order those part. Uh, and i guess if you have extra parts like you were saying on the extruder that that could work out if you want to sell those yeah yeah definitely definitely All right. um so yeah yeah i would take it as um I don't know, like, if you feel that you can do the development, like, the development work that needs to be done is, okay, we need to lower the cost on the extruder part. Like, I don't think it's it's a great deal to be paying so much money when we can spend a little bit of time developing the open source, uh, open source engineering version. It can be made at low cost, so we pave the way for much more activity on this, because... Uh, I think that's what's required to make it gain much more adoption and practicality for more people. So definitely encourage the, the deeper development approach and just getting your hands on a simple, basic version that you can then start optimizing for amazing performance, I'd say. Um, so yeah, yeah, let's keep working on it. Um, that sounds good. So this Friday we'll also go to the 2 p.m., 2 to 4 p.m. Let's continue the next session of the open source golf cart. So I'll send an email out on that. Uh, otherwise, see you on Friday. And then uh, once again, to next Tuesday. Yeah. All right. See ya. Okay. See you guys. Thanks a lot. Good. And good work. Hey, by the way, that you picked off the, just a comment on, on the plastic one with the Titan arrow. That's really good that you were able to pretty much retrofit the 1902 design into the PVC frame. That was good. But now I see we have a little bit more work to decide how we do the, probably the under, under yeah. slung extruder, which is found in the other version. So wait, but that I don't think we we ever cat it up though. Um, no, how much of the- Yeah, I copied that over to just eyeball it. And, and there's things like, I think to keep the rods the same like they'd have to flip. Um, some of those angle brackets around yeah. and a whole bunch of other things. Yeah, so you've got some work cut out for you on there. Just, uh, But you can assume that, yeah, definitely we can start with, I mean, think about either, I mean, look at William Log, right, with the, the extruder that they're open sourcing, because that's actually, that's easy enough that you can just get yourself a piece of aluminum and print, and maybe I can get you the 3D printed parts, but that's that's one that we can build completely open source. So we're just getting the stock materials like the aluminum, and then you gotta drill it, and then you just gotta get a heater block. But with that one, it's possible that you can put the, like once we do it ourselves, we have more flexibility, so you can probably put the volcano nozzle on that one. So that's what I would do. I would, I would work on uh, the Williams version and develop our own that we can then use as the, the experimental one to keep improving to a really high performance one that just works because we know that we can make it work really well because he's been using that one for years without like any clogging so we get a good start there
Yeah. So take a look at that again and yeah, figure that out. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay, guys. So great work. Um, we'll talk again. Hopefully, see you on Friday for the design sprint. All right. Those, yeah. All right. That's good. Let me see. You get you get better internet there. Who me? Yeah. Is that what you were saying? We're getting. Uh, we're talking about yeah. our fiber line. We're talking about getting on a in a fast lane. So yeah, that's that's being fiber. done. Hopefully for Friday, okay. we, we will have it. So we'll see. That, okay. All right. That might help some things. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot, guys.